everybody. Welcome to Dumb and Awful. This is Brett at Relentless Board. This is Rob at Dumb and Awful uh, on the health site. And with us this week, we have Damon Garcia. Hey, I'm Damon, and I'm on Twitter at Who is Damon. Uh, so this this is one I've been I've been looking forward to uh, for a while. I saw you on Extremely Online Left, uh, their Twitch stream, and it was it was really good. Those boys are are super awesome. Yeah, they're great. Uh, and what was so striking about it is, you know, me and Brett both came up uh, in in the Christian tradition. Uh, which in Florida, which is like basically going to like a, a missionary camp called like tears of joy, building a, a, uh, a temporary home for the migrant farmers that are being forced to work that land, Yes. then wow. pissing off, going back to sing some hymns, then going back to the, the, the youth cabin where your counselor will tell you some great jokes that include heavy use of the N word. <laughs> uh, oh my God. Real story, real story. Actually, when I, uh. That I remember this distinctly. I was in the cabin and the kids, you know, we're all like 11, 12. We're telling ghost stories and the counselor came up, uh, you know, like a youth pastor guy. And he's like, guys, you know, it's a lot of fun to, to think about like ghosts and, and warlocks and sort of the evils uh, that, you know, we're supposed to confront as God fearing Christians. But the way you're doing it isn't in a way that glorifies God. It feels like you're glorifying uh, these occult spirits. And so yeah. if we could just, you know, simmer down, let's just go to bed uh, and, and let's try to be godly going forward. And so everyone's like, okay, I guess ghost stories is over. Um, and, and then one of the kids is just like, he just, just out of the blue, he just felt like the time was right, just launched into a horribly racist black joke. <laughs> and I remembered, you know, the kids started giggling and then way over in the corner, I heard the counselor giggling. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, you know what? I think there might be something wrong with modern Christianity <laughs> as expressed in the American psyche. Um, and your Twitch streams and your videos and all that have really helped me explore that. Um, so, so thank you. Awesome. That's so funny. I, I, yeah, I was a, well, first off, I grew up in the evangelical church and then uh, when I was 18, I felt called into ministry. So that meant, okay, let me actually study this stuff so I know what the hell I'm talking about. And that resulted in me no longer agreeing with evangelical theology. <laughs> and so in August 2017, I left. And so, but I'm still passionate about the, uh, Christianity, spirituality, and all that. And so I still talk about it. But um, when I was in evangelical ministry world, I was a youth and young adults pastor for a while. And so I I know that world very well from like growing up in that youth camp and youth group environment and then being on the other side and leading that. And it's totally, totally a trip to like be a kid and be around your youth leaders and see them as like the role models you're supposed to follow. And then being a youth pastor where I like I know all the issues that all my youth leaders are dealing with and how like. They all are supposed to act like role models, but they have their own stuff that they got, whether it's like um, personal issues with family and friends and uh, or just like straight up doubting different parts of the stuff that we're supposed to believe in and get other kids mm -hmm. to believe in. It's like it's totally interesting to see that other side. But I, w I wanted the kids to see that that uh, that we're all like we're all in this together trying to figure out life together. And I think there's a lot of youth groups that just keep that separation like way too much and don't want to show any of the kids that the leaders are imperfect. Yeah, I, we're definitely going to talk about um, so, so the origins of fundamentalism in the same way that people talk about like the NRA and, and the Second Amendment and all that stuff as if it has always been that way. This idea of yeah. fundamentalist Christianity is something... Uh, that that has not always been around, at least the American strain. Uh, you have a great video about how you were enlisted in a culture war against your consent uh, yeah. as, as a child that we'll get to. <laughs> but yeah, we have uh, we have a lot to get to. Um, it, but just one note to the listener: uh, this is not. I'm not trying to. I, I've been interested in in Christian socialism in the same way I'm interested in like Muslim socialism or any sort of socialism, because at the end of the day. Uh, we all have the same goals. Uh, I'm not trying to 
evangelize here. That's a loaded term. I'm not trying to make people Christian. I don't think uh, Damon is either. Uh, your Twitch stream, you call right. the anti-fascist digital cathedral. <laughs> um, and you say your mission, you quote, term. you quote Kierkegaard where you say, uh, one must try to reintroduce Christianity to Christendom. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm very passionate about it. and But I'm not trying to, like, make anybody Christian. And I'm also not trying to make the state Christian in any way whatsoever. So I, I'm a Christian who's against Christian hegemony. I don't think that that's what, like, the original radical roots of this tradition was about. And so, yeah, Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish Christian philosopher, also the father of existentialism, said that his mission was to reintroduce Christianity to Christendom. And he felt like Christendom, like this national uh, state forcing Christianity on others, was completely losing the plot of what Christianity was to be. And so I um, feel like I'm, I affirm that radical stream throughout Christianity that, that looked at the institutional church that was just trying to gain more political power and said, that's, that doesn't feel like what Jesus was trying to do. So I'm going to go a different direction. And so I feel like I'm part of that radical stream. And it, so that includes combating right-wing Christianity very much so. And, um, but really I feel like the purpose of my, um, channel and stream and all that is to give people permission to explore this stuff, not to try to get people to become Christian when they weren't before, but there's people who are interested in exploring the connections of a radical Christianity and leftist politics. And I'm here to say there's ways to do it. And there's a whole tradition throughout history of radical Christians. And there's different ways to talk about theology and spirituality and religious practices that aren't the way that right wing uh, religious people do. And so that's what I'm here to do, to provide people space for that. That's great. Uh, at what point in that process on the American side, do you, are you forced to pick either Evanescence or Creed? Um, <laughs> There's also no. DC Talk, that branch, <laughs> that offshoot. That's slightly before my time. I was born 93. Damn, I'm old. So uh, I, I know like weird evangelical youth culture, but like a few years after Creed. Yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that a little later because you hit on like uh, Christians uh, separating themselves from the world being yeah. of the world as some sort of like evil thing and, and where that came out of the fundamentalist movement. But uh, <laughs> just so people know where we're going, this is, and Damon, so you know where I'm about to, to poke you. Uh, I, yeah. I'd like mm. to talk about uh, Constantinian versus prophetic Christianity. Ooh. I know you know a lot. I'm going to sit back and, and enjoy my, my spiked coffee when we get to liberation theology. I know yeah, you have an interest bullshit. in post-colonial studies and, and Christianity, anti-capitalist politics, yeah. uh, the radical Christian tradition. These are all uh, things you talk about a lot. Uh, some of your videos, I'd like to just briefly recap. Um, you have one, can you be a materialist and religious at the same exact time? Uh, spoiler, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, we talk culture war. Uh, why you don't owe your boss emotional labor if a demon <laughs> possesses their home? Uh, True. really psyched to talk about John the Baptist. He's one of my favorite, he is my favorite biblical figure. And nice. I like the way you, you, uh, interpret him, I think correctly as sort of an anti-imperialist vanguard party, you know, like build, building up the coalition to pass yeah. on beyond just being, you know, a, a single charismatic leader. Um, mm -hmm. you talk Christian obligations to black lives matter. Uh, and who is this God who riots? Uh, because I think that is the Christian God, and there's biblical basis for that. Um, we'll get into a little bit why Christians love cops. Uh, <laughs> hint, yeah, I, I'm curious about that one. Hint, it's because yeah. they're taught to blame victims for abuse. And <laughs> yep. uh, wh finally, why should Christians support strikes? Yes. So I'm looking forward to to all of that. Uh, this is This has been a great week in terms of uh, Christianity nerding because I, I get to talk to you and also I get to dunk on Hillsong. Are you familiar with them? Yes. <laughs> they have been on right, one. <laughs> right when you said it's a good week to dunk on Christianity, I was like, are we going to talk about Carl Lentz? Yeah, the by all begins. <laughs> I got plenty to say. I love Wait, that. Did, I love that guy. How have you uh, talked about Carl Lentz before on this show? We did a, a bonus with, I think, Extremely Online Left because uh, so Hillsong Church is an Australian based. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they are. I don't even know how to define their dogma other than like 
uh, exploitive and, and weird. Like it, it, he's the pastor <laughs> that that buddied up with Justin Bieber. It's the New York one. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But it started in Australia by this guy named Brian Houston. And then it just became a huge empire. Now there's Hillsong New York, Hillsong LA, Hillsong Houston. It's all over. The, it's a huge, uh, pretty much corporation. But yeah, so the Hillsong New York mega church was pastored by Carl Lentz. And I I see Carl Lentz as one of the, uh, well, before I did, as one of the four horsemen of millennial white evangelicalism. And like the four <laughs> big guys, is Carl Lentz, Judah Smith, who was also um, Justin Bieber's pastor and baptized him. And then there's Rick Wilkerson Jr., who was also friends with all those guys. And he's the one who married Kim and Kanye. And then there's Chad Veach. And he's kind of like, I guess, the least popular one. But those four are like popular for having like all these celebrities go to their church and have built like this network. And it's a... it's very strange. It's it's pretty much what they do at their church is just motivational speeches and um, dress like whatever the hype beasts are dressing yeah, like. Yeah, I was going to say, and, they don't just give motivational speeches. They also <laughs> wear ex- extremely expensive bracelets and too many necklaces. There's, yeah, what's, there's... what's funny about those guys is there's an Instagram account called Preacher. I think it's Preachers and Sneakers. And it's Hell just yeah. showing, <laughs> yeah, and it's showing those guys and their whole drip with, and then it shows their, their shoes and then it shows the, the cost of that actual pair of shoes and how expensive it is. And that whole page started as a way of like calling out their hypocrisy and showing how ridiculous it is that these pastors are preaching in these extremely expensive shoes. But then there's actually some evangelicals who start following that page who thought it was just a cool page that showed these cool sneakers that my favorite preachers are wearing. And so some people miss the weird irony of that. This page. is that's incredible. That's that's the like uh, I watch Verhoeven and I think that uh, killing all the bugs is not fascist. And it's in fact like super cool. And that's how everything should run. I would be into that Joel Osteen guy. But uh, <laughs> maybe if you had a bit more drip, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What if you could wear the golden calf? God would be down with that, right? He's there's they're so dope. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So a, a a couple of controversies with with Hillsong just this week. <laughs> uh, uh, so so recently, uh, so so Carl Lentz was you know one of the New York guys, and he he looks like uh, Russell Brand in uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall if a white guy was trying to be him for Halloween. <laughs> and, <laughs> There's a story that like he was hanging out in Williamsburg Park, like sun tanning, socially distanced, and uh, yeah, I, I know, yeah, no, every part of it, yeah, and and he, he was hitting on this woman, which like oh, okay, like that that's fine, you don't have to be celibate in the Protestant tradition, except he does have like a wife and and a few kids and all that, yeah, and okay. apparently he was just like you know uh, yeah no I, I'm pretty busy here in New York in media, I work in media. <laughs> Uh, I work with God and celebrities, you know, and and, uh, yeah, I'd love to connect with you. And if you're wondering what would Jesus do, the answer in Carl's mind is add your bitch's number to the notes app, not contacts, because it makes it harder for your wife to find it. (laughs) (laughs) That's something I never thought of. I never thought of that before, but he really did show me the way. If you put it in notes. When you said, when you said, what would Jesus do? I thought you were going to say, he would say this woman. And that's what he did. That, that he was true. ready to go. He was ready to. It was. It was so interesting too because he makes it sound like this was a a weak point during quarantine because he's always so busy preaching and which is really performance art and and all. I think all preaching is a performance in a way, and that's not a bad thing. It's just how it is. But it's he's always doing that, and then not being able to do that, he was just feeling down and feeling weak and then he did this but i highly doubt this is his first time there's no way that notes thing indicates a pattern you <laughs> yeah. didn't you didn't just like discover that in this moment when you you hit on a girl you thought was hot you're like oh yeah no here's the here's the move that that's, yeah exactly yeah that, that's not beginner's luck <laughs> um but look it's it's very funny um it, it's very funny to to dunk on these guys but the, also hillsong famously has huge institutional problems with like uh supporting blm uh uh incorporating people of color in any role other than uh one of their founders only ever uses uh people of color when he's on stage in front of crowds to bring him water uh there was a (laughs) there was a a story today I'll, i'll quote 
uh, Perez, who, who volunteered with them and, and worked with them. Perez also experienced what she describes as exploitative work expectations for volunteers. Uh, we paid to get an education, but we also paid to basically do free labor, claimed Perez, who graduated from the church's Hillsong International Leadership College in Sydney in 2017 before being recruited to Hillsong's Boston branch. There, she claimed she was often asked to babysit uh, Kime's then four-year-old daughter 25 hours a week, for which she was paid $150. Uh, in addition to working 60 hours a week as an unpaid Hillsong administrative assistant. Hillsong refers to it as honoring, Perez said of her labor. But over the years, I wondered, is it really honoring or is it just that you're being taken advantage of? This is something uh, that you get got into with your... Uh, emotional labor for your boss video yeah. where there's this, there's this idea that you know the the way to be a good christian is to slap on a smile and show people <laughs> that you can deal with any professional degradation because you have christ and that's evangelizing uh, <laughs> yeah. when you're exploited yeah i i heard a lot of that growing up that's the only time the workplace is brought up is just when sharing jesus with your coworkers, even if that means just acting like the best worker, working harder than anyone else. And if someone's like, damn, why do you work so hard? You'd be like, Jesus. Jesus is why I'm able to work so hard. Uh, I, you should come to my church this Sunday. And it's very weird because, like like I said, it, it, we all have to put on emotional labor at work, which is just all these extra emotions and um, like compliments and facial expressions that we have to put on. Uh, for customers, I think it's more easily noticeable, but also for our coworkers and bosses that we have to like always be on and happy and ready to be on it, this good team that we're on in this uh, family and this workplace and all that. But it, it cr there's a lot of preachers that say that you need to put on even more emotional labor so that you can show what Jesus is like and. I feel like as a Christian leftist that uh, when we talk about the workplace, it should be about like actually unionizing our workplace and actually realizing, oh, yeah, God says that we are worth more than what our workplace says. So therefore, we should act like it and fight for more because we actually have way more dignity than any workplace tells us we do. And so I think that's the direction more preachers should go to. Are you sure that's not... Uh demonic tongues coming through <laughs> you right now <laughs> i don't think so yeah no I, I say that that demon thing be, because there is sort of a a bosses versus workers dynamic in christianity and, and, and even like the bible and, and the early history of the church where you say in the video that you know bosses tell you that having jesus makes emotional labor effortless right because christ can overcome anything so if, if you are yeah. actually pushing for as uh, some sort of better working conditions that that's somehow anti-Jesus, and we see actually yeah, because you're not his... grateful. Yeah, and we that's we, what it we is. see who who's who would be ungrateful about Jesus. Obviously, some sort of infernal creature, and the the <laughs> history of demon possession actually is it's low status people in society, it's exploited women and children especially, and they get possessed by a demon, and that's when all of a sudden they have things to say about their exploiters. Like that allows them to have. Uh, the the voice. It's funny that when demons speak through people, uh, that they, they usually have a message for their superiors who were abusing them yeah. in some way. <laughs> yeah, that's what anthropologists discovered. And just looking at all these reports of demonic possession, that it was usually um, a child, a woman, or a man who has had a low position within that community. And yeah, it's it's always a message for their superiors, messages that they felt like they couldn't express before, and so. It's um like I, f I feel like th there's a couple ways to look at demonic possession in that way. Like we could say that um, when they're in that traumatic position where they're not able to express their concerns in that community, then something opens up within them and another spirit takes over to to help them out. Or you could say it, it's just what happens in the brain that an alternate um, stream of consciousness opens up in order to express what's not being able to be expressed. And uh, you could say that's just simply a gift of neurobiological evolution. The fact that you can be put in the right circumstances and an alternate streams of consciousness open up and you could be taken over by something like 
we we can do that and um we're not saying that there's actually like other spirits attached to it other people could say that but we could actually like see that happening and like someone's real physical self and so it's interesting to to even think how within the christian story when people talk about demons um that is usually the case too like with jesus when he uh, encounters people with demons these are people who are traumatized by roman imperialism legion so right? yeah one of the demons that jesus uh talks to he says he announces himself as legion and legion was also the word used to refer to a fleet of roman soldiers and so there's something i think way more interesting going on there um that says something about the society that demon possession takes in than just like oh uh these evil scary demons got into somebody then we prayed and then they got out i think it's like that's like such a surfacey reading but it's so much more interesting when you think about like the societal causes and the societal implications i was gonna say i can always stand to hear more about how demonic possession is the original me too movement <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. that's fucking wild i'd never heard that before yeah the the you said the demonic manifests itself through the powerless as a judgment yeah. on the powerful, um, yeah. which, you know, it's not surprising then that these things are uh, seen as evil because as we know, that sort of uh, radical and anti-empire ideology with the preference for the poor and those society deemed unclean, uh, that sounds an awful lot like liberation theology, which is the worst thing in the world, uh, unless you're a, you're a CIA agent trying to rack up kills in the eighties. Um, I was right. I was hoping as I, I I sit back and sip my coffee, you could explain to to me where I I've tried to figure out liberation theology. It seems like it's mm. a lot of it's either uh, white teens on TikTok, uh, white academics that write dense books that I, I can't quite understand. Um, and people on Twitter who have lots of flags in their profile. Could you, could you maybe take right. me through what is liberation theology? Where did it come from? Why, why is it not more popular given that when you look at Christ in the Bible, it seems like he, he very much does have this preference for the poor yeah. and, and liberation. So liberation theology was a term coined and like really fleshed out in uh, the mid 1960s during Vatican II. They had all of these conferences all over the world of bishops who talked about what changes they could make um, in response to the modern world. And a lot of people's contexts were was modern pluralism. But in Latin America, their context was severe poverty and underdevelopment. So when they were talking about changes they could make to the church and to theology, that was their context. There was also um, a lot of ref leftist revolutions going on at the time and Marxist guerrilla fighters. And so they talked about um, what kind of God they could worship in response to their context, which was a God who chooses the side of the poor and the oppressed. And so simply, I would say liberation theology is the interpretation of theology from the perspective of the poor and the oppressed. And so they said, God has a preferential option for the poor, which was already an idea within Catholic social teaching, but wasn't that popular or really fleshed out as much as it could be. And so they took that and said, therefore, the church should have a preferential option for the poor. And so that resulted in them developing liberation theology and a new liberation Christology and ecclesiology study of the church and all that and then that also resulted in priests teaching liberation theology and also teaming up with marxist guerrilla fighters yeah you have a, so, uh, an anecdote about uh i'm gonna mispronounce this but uh frey beto is that correct yeah frey beto was a, a brazilian uh, liberation theologian so he was arrested and they told him how could you like be a Marxist and a Christian. Don't you know that Marx was against religion? Don't you know that Marx said that religion is the opium for the masses? And then he was like, well, it's the bourgeoisie who made religion the opium for the masses while taking the world for itself. And so by preaching a Lord of the heavens only, that's what he said. And so I think that's very interesting. And, and a lot of those liberation theologians saw it that way, where it's like, it's just obvious 
that we would get involved in these Marxist revolutions and fight against our capitalist governments. That's just obviously what Jesus would do. And so there even um, Oscar Romero is a big name within liberation theology stories. In the 1980s, he was sent to a poor region in El Salvador because these priests were preaching liberation theology too much and but in el salvador it was in the middle of a civil war and there was right-wing paramilitary groups that were killing their own people and were suppressing the poor also aided by the united states and so they sent oscar romero saying calm them down get them to stop talking so much about politics and start talking about jesus and he went and saw the suffering of the people and he was radicalized and so he started preaching liberation theology and then one night on the radio, he said that these military groups need to stop killing. I know you y'all are Christian, like think about your Christian duty and stop killing people. And then the next day during mass, they came in and killed him. And then at his funeral, uh, they came and killed about 30 to 50 more people. And that those groups is, is, is connected to like the CIA funding of groups who were trying to stamp out leftist movements, but also... Pope John Paul II's support of the CIA doing those things because of his anti-communist agenda. And so because of all of that, liberation theology was quickly um, recognized as just complete heresy. And there's a lot of liberation theologians that were excommunicated. And so th there's a lot of people who either never heard of liberation theology, or if they did, they're just like, I don't know what that is, but I just know it's heresy. I'm not sure why, though. And so there's... um. That tradition started Latin America, and then a lot of it got stamped out the way that a lot of the left got stamped out. And it still exists today, um, and more more in like academic settings now, which is why you'll see it more from academics. And it sucks because I feel like it's so helpful for people. And I, I think the only reason it had to develop as a distinct theological lens is because of the church's history with siding with the ruling class again and again oh, and again. Man. And so it's like, remember what the Bible says. And so there's so, I mean, and I say that because the whole Bible's written from the perspective of the poor and the oppressed under the boot of empire after empire after empire. And so there's, I know a lot of people, as they get more and more into liberation theology, they stop using the word liberation theology and just start calling it theology because that's what it feels wow. like when you just read this stuff. It's... And so, so yeah, and that, but I was to say that there's a lot of, um, white academics talking about it now. And I actually heard about it also from some white progressive Christian pastors. I first heard of it from Rob Bell. And then that's, Oh, shit. I was yeah, like, I know him. Yeah. It was like, this is awesome. And then I just dug into it from there with the like actual liberation theologians. And then I kind of forgot about it. And then years later, as I was, it's kind of like in this uh, liminal space, not sure what to do with my life. I saw Brian McLaren speak and I was just letting him know, like, just some of the stuff I was going through and he suggested you should check out liberation theology. I was like, Oh yeah, that is great. So it feels weird that like two white men uh, helped me realize <laughs> the importance of liberation theology when it's like, it, it's when so much of it is about like getting that other perspective, well, than in fairness, the Eurocentric perspective. In fairness, they, they killed a, a lot of the people that were into liberation theology in the global mm -hmm. South. So you're, you're sort of left with, uh, it's like the Fred Hampton effect. You, you're, Anyone that was really organizing and, and acting and, and putting theory into praxis got just absolutely murked by the, the police or the forces of reaction. So, yeah, you're going to have a lot of sort of uh, uh, white academics remaining because, frankly, nobody's afraid of them. I'm surprised yeah. it, it got turned into a heresy, though, because it... Every time I hear about liberation theology, it just sounds like Jesuits. Well, it, it's, it's funny. It, <laughs> yeah. it did get... It did get turn into a heresy on the Catholic side because they have sort of the centralized church uh, on, on the Protestant side where they didn't have this uniform, like, Nope, this is bad. Uh, it, it sort of gave birth to the, the modern culture war. Cause there was this focus all of a sudden on uh, more on praxis than belief in the modernist period. And how do you square that with uh, essentially God, how do how do I put it? Help me here, Damon. Yeah, there's there was this movement in Protestantism called the Social Gospel, which it's not directly connected to liberation theology, but it people were talking about how do we 
actually respond to all this poverty and the problems caused by capitalism and and how do we respond to it theologically so it makes sense that other people would be thinking these things in other places and so but the social gospel is also more linked to the actual uh, progressive movement uh big capital p progressivism like when it began in in a way of like also like the, the modernist movement and so there was a lot of people, like you said, saying, how do we actually live this out? What about praxis? And what if praxis is actually more important than belief? And this was also in response to people reading the Bible differently under modernism, realizing, okay, we know a lot now because of Darwin and because of um, our other ways of studying history and the scientific method and the goalposts of truth got shifted a bit. And so now let's read the Bible with this lens oh, looks like there's a lot of stuff in here that couldn't have actually happened. And so there was secular scholars that were just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so this didn't happen, this didn't happen. But there was also Christian scholars that were like, yeah, this didn't happen, but that just means that it's a different kind of text. It's not like a, a, the text that we would write today. They were writing in a different uh, genre. And so when we come across parts that we think, oh, that couldn't have happened, that means that the writer is doing something even more significant. And so we have to read sacred texts for what they actually are, not read them literally, but read them literally and realize, okay, this is a poem. This is an allegory. This is a parable. This is like realize there's different ways of writing this stuff that they participated in. So let's read it for what it is. So that also resulted in, okay, then maybe um, praxis is more important. Um, when we were able to read the Bible in that way. And that uh, resulted in churches feeling like they were losing power from all sides because of modernism. And so they said, uh, in response to all that, actually, the Bible should be read literally. Actually, the Bible should be read like the way we read any text today. The Bible is 100% inerrant. There can be no errors, no contradictions. And um, we have our knowledge. And then the world has their knowledge. We have our education. The world has their education. We have our media and art, and they have their media and art. And it was about dominating over modernism because Catholicism was able to say, that's a heresy, modernism. But Protestantism had to <laughs> form had to form a whole uh, coalition of ministers against modernism. Um, yeah, this, this was and, where fundamentalists came from, right? Yeah, the, so they're, the schism they're tight. between Christian exactly. knowledge and worldly knowledge. It's how you get Christian movies and games and music and skate mm -hmm. shops. And then there's the worldly <laughs> music and games and skate shops that are cooler. Yeah, so they're <laughs> tied together by the, the fundamentals of faith. That's, so that's where that word comes from. And so, so they had these pamphlets called the fundamentals that they would mail out to all these ministers. But it was purely about dominating over modern education and media. And so... It's uh, it's awful, but but there also were other Christian groups that didn't go that direction. Like the mainline Protestants just kept being influenced by modern scholarship. And there's a lot of people that don't know that. They think of Christians and they think of the culture war fighting evangelicals, and they don't know that there's actually like a ton of Christian churches and Christian institutions and seminaries that just kept being influenced by modern scholarship and weren't afraid of uh, all these new scientific discoveries and were able to just integrate that in their faith. And so yeah, there's... Yeah, none of them are trying yeah. to dominate me. And honestly, let, let, you know, yeah. let's be honest here, succeeding kind of in some places. Yeah. Other ways of seeing, of, of doing Christianity and doing theology and integrating it with scholarship, but... The evangelicals are a lot louder because they're the ones like fighting this culture war and the mainline Protestants are just doing their thing and they, they, they don't want to make too much of a fuss that they, they don't feel the need to have all these huge outreach events. And so they're a lot quieter and therefore not as visible. And when you say there's a lot of ways to sort of uh, do theology, I mean, if I'm understanding correctly, liberation theology was sort of a starting point that once you look into it, 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 you can't help but start spinning off into other branches of sort of a shared ideology. I'm thinking of like mm -hmm. James Cone, Black Liberation Theology, Feminist yes. Theology, Queer Theology, Death of God Theology. Uh, if, uh, actually kind of like you to explain that if you could. <laughs> yeah. But um, 
Actually, could you could you say a little bit about the yeah. the, the theology? Maybe this will be the the theology segment. Sure. And then we'll we'll get into some materialist analysis after that. Sure. So all theology is actually contextual. Liberation theology is just honest about it. So it's contextual. What, is that, what does that mean? It's it's rooted in the theologians' uh, actual position in society. It's rooted in their own experiences and what they've learned, what they have gone through, and then they do theology from that perspective. And liberation theology is just honest about that and says, our perspective is the perspective of the poor and the oppressed, and how can we talk about God from that perspective? But there's a lot of theology that just says, no, we're just reading the Bible. We're, we're just reading for what it says. This is just what the Bible says. When it's like, no, you're reading from a particular perspective that uh, allows you to read it a certain way. Like when and people so, say they're not political, it's like, you, yeah. yes, you are. You must be. It would be impossible <laughs> exactly. for that to be true. Exactly. And so, so through that, a lot of, through liberation theology, a lot of people started being more intentional. And so, yeah, we got like queer theology, feminist theology. Um, there's Minjung theology in Korea. There's Dalit theology in India from the perspective of the lowest caste in India. There's Palestinian liberation theology. There's uh, Mujerista theology from the perspective of Latina women, uh, womanist theology, black women. So there's like all this, there's so much to explore when you get into this world. And that's like the world I'm in exploring all these theologies. And it's just so fascinating and exciting and inspiring to me. And then someone says, oh, no, I, I can't be Christian because Christians are like uh, anti-gay or anti this, anti that. Read the Bible literally. I'm like, that's not even on my radar anymore. I'm like just so deep into a complete other direction. And so um, that's like the world I'm in. And but yeah, for death of God theology is like kind of a, a different well, real quick, before Extreme. we get to that, then, uh, mm -hmm. what do you say to someone that makes that critique where you say, like, oh, I'm really into queer theology, and they're like, well, what, are you just making shit up now? Like, <laughs> yeah. like what does that mean? So, well... Um, what, what distinguishes black liberation theology right. or queer theology uh, from, you know, uh, your baseline liberation theology or, or mainline Christian thought? What are the distinguishing factors of them? I think it's part, part of it is recognizing that we're working with um, when we're reading the Bible and doing theology, we're working with symbols and allegories and parables and myths. When I say myths, I don't, I don't mean like a fake story that tries to fool people. I mean, like, um, a story or an image that tries to reveal truth and doesn't mean that it's literally true, but it's revealing truth. And so when you realize you're, that's, that's what we're working with. You, you, then you can use these symbols um and try to figure out what are they saying to modern day people instead of just trying to figure out like the literal details of the story and so there's queer theologies that are just like okay let's actually look at the bible look at the historical context of these words and translations and realize actually the bible doesn't say anything about gay people there's some stuff no, that what about the lay with the man bit the lay with the man bit i think that was um a practice recognized as this is what a neighboring tribe is doing and it's connected to idol worship and we have to do everything that we can to not do what other tribes are doing because we have to be a distinct tribe and make sure that we survive. And so I think there's that bit, but also I there's a lot that's just culturally, that was culturally true, that was kind of theologically justified. So there was like cultural realities that they that was just the reality they're living in in that time and place and then they would just say and god did it god said it and so that was just like the way that they understood things and that's okay and but i and then you get to the new testament um paul uses words like arsenokotai and malakoi um and that says that they will not make it into the kingdom of heaven but those words were translated homosexual but in the 1950s before 1950s, it wasn't translated that. And those two words are referring to male prostitutes and child prostitutes. And so they these were people who were participating in these um, exploitative uh, Roman orgies where the men would leave their wife at home where she just stays there to have reproductive sex. And the men would go have recreational sex with whoever they wanted. But it was a lot of exploitation. 
uh, with sex slaves and child slaves. And so Paul is looking at that whole hairball of sin and says, they're not, they don't get in. But Paul would not have been able to grasp your modern day gay neighbor with a boyfriend. That That's impossible to imagine in the first century. And so this, so it's so in reality, the Bible doesn't speak on it. And then we just look at other verses that say, about being loving and accepting to people who are different than us. And we realize, okay, what are we to do then with gay people today? So there's plenty of gay Christians and there's plenty of, of people who, who are doing queer theology that just simply say, hey, it's okay to be gay and Christian. But there's also like queer theology that says God is gay and that the Trinity is like this Based. queer orgy Still, and all this stuff. So the it's The Trinity like... is Polly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so, uh, so there, there's all kinds of ways to do that, but... But I mean, I, I always, yeah. I always love the, uh, I always love the root of these things is like, yeah, at some point, a bunch of people reinterpreted the word to mean something that allows them to hate gay people. That's yeah. like, cool. At what point did they reinterpret the 80 times he said, fuck rich people into a way that makes <laughs> it okay? Like, explain that one to me. And I was like, don't worry about it. He wants you to be rich. So like, I literally every gospel says, fuck rich people in some way, shape or form. Is this just incrementalism though? The, the. Because you say, no, that's not saying that gay people can't get into heaven. It, it's sex workers. I'm pretty sure that's also a bummer. I, I don't want all my sex worker buddies to not be with me in heaven. That's like half my timeline. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, there wasn't like that uh, independent sex workers in first century Rome. It was uh, extremely exploitative um, sex slavery. They they had no rights. Uh, pe people who were sex slave had absolutely no rights and were treated worse than slaves uh and in general and so it was an awful position to be in but yeah there's there's uh definitely pro sex pro independent sex workers today um but there's i think we, we have to realize that there is a different world that they were writing from which is different from ours and people like to read our modern world into the text and that's uh just irresponsible for any ancient text Although I, I mean, you say that, but I do think there are some echoes that work pretty one to one. I was hoping you could say a little about uh, James Cone's work. Yeah, his uh, Black Liberation theology, and he was his mission was really looking at the Black Power movement and the intellectual tradition that came from the Black Power movement, and combining that with Black theology. And so, like his two huge influences were Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. And so he was. He found a way to really um, combine those two perspectives, and he his probably most popular work was his last book that he wrote before he died, which was The Cross and the Lynching Tree, which was talking about how, first of all, the way we lynched black people in America is very uh, similar to crucifixion, and when we can understand that Jesus' death on the cross was a first century lynching, then we could see uh, modern lynching in a whole new light. And we could see that crucifixion in a whole new light because crucifixion was a, a political punishment. You were put, anyone who threatened the Roman imperial powers were put on a cross in public uh, on a hill in like by the gate so everyone could see as a way of saying, this is what happens to people who threaten Rome's power. And lynching was a similar thing. It was in public on a tree for everyone to see as a way of saying, this is what happens to those who threaten what we want to do. And so there was, so James Cone did a lot of that work of like helping us see um, the black power movement is like, is something that's very holy and sacred and God is in that. And that there is, um, when we can understand that crucifixion as a first century lynching, then we can understand politics and christianity in a whole new way and so um i think that's like really powerful for today as well yeah especially if you contextualize uh modern police violence against communities of color as yeah. the the new lynching uh then yeah. you can sort of see this this christian obligation to get involved in these uh social movements and stop fucking posting pictures of protesters and cops <laughs> hugging on the timeline and all that shit yeah, exactly <laughs> Actually, before we get to uh, the last theology, death of God theology, I was just wondering if you could say a little about um, what is the Christian obligation to these movements like Black Lives Matter? Like, isn't it bad 
to, to riot, shouldn't we forgive <laughs> and accept and reconcile with the police? All right. Well, first of all, yeah, the uh, Jesus rioted. Jesus in the temple. He sure did. Flipping tables. Uh, people love that with a whip and everything. And he, I mean, that he didn't was do literally... it alone either. He, he brought his crew with him so that he could yes. not be arrested. That was a planned demonstration. Yes, that was so. Yeah. And that was the second demonstration of the week. Uh, the first demonstration was coming in on the donkey while the, um, while, who was it? It was, uh. I think it was Herod Antipas was coming on the other side of the city on his war horse. And so that was like a demonstration um, to show like the difference between him and and the Roman rulers. And so I love that and then, Christ was a based irony poster. And that, that is my theology. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll be and, walking in Christ. <laughs> and then the other demonstration was going into the temple and uh, ruining the whole market that they had there. And so he literally did property damage by flipping the tables and um, no god no he literally did looting because he poured the coins out all over the ground and let the animals out that they were selling people don't don't uh realize that so jesus i think uh wasn't afraid of <laughs> a little bit of rioting and also i feel like um jesus or like the whole christian tradition and the whole jewish tradition calls people to fight for justice. Like I'm thinking of the prophet Amos where he has God say, um, I'm tired of your songs. Like get, get rid of your songs and your instruments and all that. I want justice that that I'd stop singing to me and bringing me offerings. I want to see justice. And so I am trying to tell the whole Christian church, like to follow God means to fight for justice. And so it's, um, yeah, and, and then the whole yeah the whole cops thing. I it was interesting to see a lot of conservative Christians just posting stuff about hugging cops and like we just need to love cops right now. And it reminded me growing up in the evangelical church of seeing how many times people would bring up forgiveness in a response to someone being abused mm-hmm. to the person that was being abused, where it was like. Okay, look, we're all imperfect and we're all just trying and that person made a mistake and you need to forgive them and reconcile them even though they abused you. And then if they said, no, I'm not going to, I refuse to be in community with this person, then they were the ones seen as being unforgiving and not Christ-like. And so there's like more cruel and more like soft versions of that kind of story that's happened in so many churches. Like I think anyone who grew up in the evangelical church has at least one story of someone that they know should have gone to prison because of what they did and they didn't. And so I think a lot of evangelical Christians grew up in that environment where people were let off the hook in the name of forgiveness when they should have been held accountable for their abuse. And so that makes a lot of sense for those Christians who grew up like that to then say, hey, the cops are imperfect and we just need to forgive them and love them and um, not to be against them. It's always and you're bad. <laughs> I would say it's always fascinating the way that like, I, I never thought about this on the on the Christianity side, but modern neoliberalism has done such a good job since like uh, 40s, 50s of neutering everything, right? Like uh, any activists uh, like MLK, anybody, civil rights movement, uh, even even getting women the vote, all of these all of these movements have been neutered to just like they stood around and said nice slogans, and the people in power just gave them things, and they they managed to do that with the Bible at this point too, where it's like yes. Jesus is completely neutered, the the apostles didn't do any radical acts other than just like suffering. The only radical act allowed in modern America is you <laughs> suffering while the yes. powerful get off, and it's like it, it's incredible how that's managed to work its way into fucking everything. Like the only thing you're allowed to do is suffer. Yeah, there's definitely been a, a, I was gonna say it's funny, but no, it's highly depressing that there is this uh, systemic de-emphasization of challenging power. I mean, like, like Jesus was talking about the rich people and the eye of the needle. And it's just yeah. like, yeah, well, you know, so sometimes Jesus riffs and sometimes he, he misses, right? <laughs> there's yeah. this real, they, they de-emphasize challenging power, but uh, to come back to the temple briefly, which, uh, by the way, built with slaves, just throwing it out there. Problematic uh, yeah. Solomon, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, if that, you one look was, at... that one was built by Herod, but definitely also Oh, yeah, slaves. that's true. Yeah. Second mm-hmm. temple period. 
I've taken an L on Second Temple period. Uh, what, what am I, the Essenes? Huh? Huh? Uh, so if you actually look at the progression of, of the Gospels, that uh, Jesus in, in the temple uh, throwing over the tables and all that and doing property damage, which is very problematic. Uh, you, you know, Mark brings it up, but then we get to, to Luke, who heightens it and 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 more and more emphasizes the fact yeah. that oh by the way not only did he fuck shit up but he threw out the capitalists to call the sick in and heal them yeah. and to teach against <laughs> empire he's an anti-imperialist pro medicare for all property damaging radical and if you go like oh well you know maybe luke was a bit of a, a madman john shows up <laughs> later in the gospels and goes damn this story's good i'm gonna put it <laughs> chapter two i don't yes. want people to miss this shit if they get bored at, like <laughs> this is going right up front and, and then yep. somehow you know a, a couple millennia of church doctrine and now all of a sudden it's just like you know if if a cop throws you on the ground you should uh uh understand where he's coming from and act with compassion it's just this perversion <laughs> of of christian maxims that should be good you should act with compassion but sometimes you have to uh choose sides on who is getting the compassion i think it's not compassion to watch people suffer and do nothing to help them or to make friends with the people abusing them it's awful and, and it's so much of it i don't think people realize like is to just uh totally like neuter any sort of fight for justice and to just take it and um and it just serves the ruling class and i think there is people i think i think there are moments throughout history where there are people who like make these intentional decisions to shift theology in that kind of direction and in support of the ruling class but then there's people who are just born in it and it's it's just called theological education at seminary and they don't even realize <laughs> that that's what's that's what they're learning and then that's oh. what they're teaching this makes me I, I went to a Jesuit Catholic school, high school, mm -hmm. and I never understood because like, I'm not Catholic. I just, you know, uh, Florida education sucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was the only option to get a, an education that wasn't horrific. And uh, by and large, I thought all the Jesuits were nice people, the ones that I met, but I never understood why they were considered radicals. But this is helping me to understand because they so heavily emphasize helping the poor and that the poor are the most essential mission. I get why they're considered radicals within church because yeah. they don't really give a fuck about the hierarchy at all. I'm like, that is radical if you're the person running things. Yeah. So Pope Francis is a Jesuit too. And he was also inspired and influenced by liberation theology and um, growing up in Latin America. And so he actually brought back some of the liberation theologians that were excommunicated. And that's awesome. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, there's a ton of Catholics that see Pope Francis as like just Satan spawn and to <laughs> to left this uh, radical communist. And it's like I feel like news, Pope Francis. They're, they're Protestants then. If if you don't, that's like your one <laughs> job as a Catholic. If, if you don't like the Pope, you're yeah. a Protestant. Fuck off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. So it's funny. It, like, pope Francis is like, I think, the same way we view a lot of liberals, where it's like. Okay, good on you for being like more socially progressive in these few ways, but you still got a long way to go, Pope Francis. And so it's kind of funny. It's like there's just a lot of Catholics that hate him and think he's way too leftist. And I'm like, he he needs to be way more radical. Well, I think a lot of uh, Catholics or Protestants uh, they come up in this, and I th I think there's there's a through line here uh, that this Constantinian to colonialist. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, Christianity, like like so much of missionary work and and colonization, uh, occurred with the 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 backing of the church. Uh, you have an, an article or you have a video: why white Christians respond to white supremacy with more white supremacy. And, and I was hoping you could sort of uh, uh, take us through how we go from Constantine to uh, people who identify as a Christian fundamentalist Americans uh, in D.C. burning Black Lives Matter placards, as we saw right. this week. Yeah. So, first of all, the um, the whole the whole church started after after Jesus. And we have like this. Everyone loves pointing out the first church was basically uh, communist because they shared everything, and they did the, the only way. 
And the only way that they weren't communists is the fact that they, did, they didn't share the work and you, you got to share the work, but they did literally share all their resources. Yeah, they Anyone... built a dual power uh, so that they could look at the Roman imperialist military hegemon versus, you know, actually what they were doing and go, which one of these is, is meaningfully affecting your material interests? Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like you have to build some, but anyway, sorry, continue. Yeah, so exactly. So they... Uh, you had your needs taken care of, and 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 it was illegal to be a Christian. If you were caught, then you were also put on a cross, or uh, fed to an animal, or cast out on an island. And so, the um, then in the three hundreds, all of a sudden, the Roman Emperor Constantine becomes a Christian, and it's no longer illegal to become to be a Christian, and that you have public churches all of a sudden, and um. That totally changed what the church looked like. In fact, there was even some Christians that said, I don't like how this is now. Like St. Benedict of Nursia uh, went out into the desert and took some other Christians, and they said, okay, for us to be a Christian means to pray and to work and to serve the poor. And so that's what we're going to do over here in the desert, because now what's going on in the church, that's not Christianity. They, so they left that behind. And that was like kind the original of... original hipster. Yeah. And so that was like... Uh, uh, yeah, especially to see people going to church just so they can look good for Constantine. And so it, it totally looked different. And there's some people that say, like, Christianity died uh, with that Constantinian shift. Like, that radical vision of what it started was completely destroyed with that shift. Um, but then you could also point to, like I said, people had stepped out, out of step with that uh, stream and try to follow a more radical stream. And that has just continued throughout church history. But that stream of the Constantinian church has continued, which is just, how do we get people to become Christian? We take over uh, the whole nations and force them to be Christian. And Christian tankies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, so we see that throughout history. And even um, like one of my favorite Christians in history is St. Francis of Assisi. And I think he's really interesting because... He did do war crimes early in life. Just have to point that out. All your faves are problematic. <laughs> Yes, and then he my stopped. Dude, my dude loved to burn a village. I'm just saying. <laughs> and so, so nobody's nerfed. True, true, true. Uh, but he lived during the Crusades, and he and so if if you were to ask Saint Francis during his time period, what is Christianity? People would point to the Crusades, but he started this whole order of friars that he called the Lesser Brothers, and said that we are going to commit to poverty and to helping the poor and sick. And he was so committed to helping the poor that like, if he saw, at least according to legend, if he saw like someone in the street who had less than he did, then he would immediately give what he had. And so like, that was his whole he spirituality. Meant that, he meant that literally, by the way, uh, Francis famous for actually taking the clothes off his back and yes. giving it to people yeah. and then just walking around naked, whistling to himself. Cool guy. So I he's mean, like the Catholic di diogenesis, diogenes? Pro probably smells yeah. terrible, but cool guy. His head's in the right place. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he, was, he, was, he lived a difficult life, especially because he was like so committed to it. He refused to like eat good food. Even when he got really sick, they're like, here, eat this chicken. It'll help you feel better. He's like, no, it's too bougie. He's like, no, come on, just eat it. He's like, fine, just so I could feel better. And then after he got one of his followers to tie a rope around him and uh, walk around with him in town saying, like, look at this horrible person. And shout so out, <laughs> shout out to St. Francis of Assisi, uh, the patron saint of eating disorders. <laughs> yeah. So when he was on his deathbed, one of those last things he said was, I wish I would have treated brother ass better, which is referring to his body. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> so... Anyway, also real quick in terms of the clothes thing, one of his followers, uh, Juniper, Saint Juniper, he was also uh, famous for uh, just giving giving away his clothes that that his own like order of lesser brothers would give to him, and then he would just give it away to someone who needed clothes, and they had to tell him to stop doing that. And so one day, the, the story goes that he was uh, sitting outside and. A homeless person came up to him and asked for his clothes, and he's like, sorry, I'm not allowed to give it to you, but I wouldn't stop you if you took it from me. And then he just <laughs> took it from him, and he just sat there. And so, Powerful. Yeah. But I was going to say, that is like a, I thought that's a so totally... That, that's how to deal with doctrine, is, is just be like, 
Well, you didn't say I couldn't be robbed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I say all this, like, this is like a different Christian life than what's going on with the Crusades that's happening at the same time. And so I I look at, like, throughout uh, Christian history, there is this stream of Constantinian institutional colonizer Christianity. And, um, and then there's this stream of radical christianity and i i see like that constantinian colonizer stream as like um just a loud banging gong like um paul says like if i if i can preach and do all these spiritual gifts but i don't have a love then i'm nothing but a loud resounding gong and um and so i i that's what i see that stream and then the stream of radical christianity i see as more of like this bass note that's keeping the rhythm going that the life actually comes from. And it's, but it's always in contrast to that um, loud, powerful colonizer, Constantinian Christianity. It, Christians have to be honest about white supremacy. And um, it's still extremely prevalent today, but the history of white supremacy is also rooted in forms of Christian theology. And what we see, first of all, in the history of um, Christians starting to evangelize to other cultures is there already was an aspect of this idea of the civilized and the savages. Like that was already an idea even before Christianity existed. And I think that kind of got um, melded in there as you had more and more Greek Christians and they um, saw new nations that they're going to as the savages and we're bringing Christianity to them. And not all Christian churches that spread had had this ideology as they were spreading, but a lot of them did. And we have to be honest about that. During the second temple period, like Hellenization was a big thing. Like even within uh, the, the early church and Judaism at the time, there were splits between like well, do we want to be these sort of backwoods, uh, desert savages, or do we want to be, you know, the the Greeks? Like, like there was mm-hmm. a a very ongoing dialogue about what it is to be civilized, just like culturally and and politically. So it's not surprising that uh, that makes its way into you know early church writing. Absolutely, that's exactly what it is. And so over time, that just stuck where it's. It was like us civilized people and then the savages and just evolved to us Christians and the savages. And so Columbus in his journals like is literally referring to the savages. And then when he's referring to his people, he's saying the Christians. He's not saying the white people or the Europeans. He's saying us Christians and the savages. And so and he even like viewed himself as like bringing Christ to them. And so their whole thing was like, we're going to get these savages to stop being savage by introducing them to Christianity. And over time, another evolution of that Christian versus savages was white versus savage, and then white versus non-white. And I think it definitely, part of that evolution throughout history, for a long time, it took the form of Christian and savage. And that just, I think, evolved to white and non-white. And so... Uh, it's awful, and we have to fight against that, and Christians have to be honest about our part uh, in that, and we have to um, do everything we can to fight uh, white supremacy in general, but also just exercise white supremacy out of all these theological developments over time that have justified um, white supremacy and genocide and slavery and total um, destruction of the world. So no more Polish popes. I guess not. <laughs> oh, come on. We only have a sample size of one. <laughs> it's it, enough. That it, was enough. If I've learned anything from hiring Polish labor, it's it's that one pole isn't going to accomplish anything. <laughs> you, you need a whole gang of them to get anything done. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, but, but I was, I was going to say that, like, so that, that white supremacy is just, like, a part of the history of Christianity. And so there's, uh, when, when we see in the United States, is like, that slow evolution of, like, desegregation the church was always slowest in that evolution like there was desegregated schools but then the the private christian schools stayed segregated for like a decade or two longer and then um even in church like there was still segregated uh churches and still segregated ministry events like billy graham 
some of his like earliest stories was saying, I'm not going to show up to your event unless it's desegregated. And um, and so they had to. And but there was but Billy Graham was just saying, like, it, it's already like illegal. Like, this is just what the world is like. Like, church needs to catch up. And he wasn't making like a, a brand new move. But the um, so because of that, because the church being so late on a lot of that desegregation, um, that there's still a lot of aspects within Christianity, especially evangelicalism, that is just like still pretty white supremacist. And um, even like when you go to a seminary, a lot of the stuff you learn is just Eurocentric theology. It's just like Western Eurocentric theologians from Augustine to uh, Aquinas to Martin Luther and John Calvin to John Wesley to whoever denominational leader they want to teach you about in that seminary. And um, and then they tell you that's the history of Christian theology. These like few white dudes that we just connected a branch through when there's actually like so many other ways of talking about Christianity throughout history that they never get taught about in seminary, in the, the school where they learn how to be a pastor. One of those ways is a, uh, a materialist perspective. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask you, you identify as both a materialist and a Christian uh, mystic. Uh, uh, what does yeah. that mean? How can that be? And how can a materialist be religious? Yeah, so for me, materialism is recognizing that ideas have their source in our material conditions. It's not the other way around where an idea pops up in our head and that makes us want to do something materially. It's um, It comes from the material first and foremost. And I think um, that that's, that's how I, I view the world because if a problem arises, I'm going to think about the material causes for that problem first. I'm not going to think of like, was there some sort of like spirit that caused this or whatever. And I think there's a ton of religious people that think exactly like I just said. Um, so it's, I think there's a ton of religious people that don't even realize that they're more materialist than they are idealist um, because they've been told that um, materialism is pretty much vulgar materialism, which is just like, there's there's nothing else. There's nothing else but the material. And we cannot um, say that there is anything else. I think material, I think materialism is about like, where do you think the source of ideas are from? And so there are ways of talking about um, religious faith that doesn't involve saying God made it happen. I think that is a certain perspective, but that's not all of their perspectives. And, and, and that has never really been my perspective. And so there is um, also a tradition of apophatic theology or negative theology that I've always been very inspired by, which is about talking about God by saying what God is not, as opposed to cataphatic theology, which is talking about God by saying what God is. And so at the apophatic... Yeah, no, I, think our, I think our listeners are familiar with <laughs> cataphatic uh, uh, <laughs> theology or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So Sorry, just don't, don't insult the listener, okay? <laughs> all like, right, we sorry, all have limited everybody. time on this earth. Thank you for doing it for me, though. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I got you. Uh, so the apophatic theologians are saying things like, Okay, g sure, God is love, but not in the way that I understand love or the way that a 14th century farmer understands love or the way that a 2nd century peasant understands love. It, anything we say about God at the same time fails to describe God. There is nothing we can say that can contain what God is. And so all images and words and symbols are just mere attempts at describing something we can never describe. And so... That, for me, is like what I think of when I think of like when trying to describe God. I can never know exactly what God is, so therefore I don't try to. Uh, for, I'm okay with God being this mysterious cloud of unknowing. That's fine. And um, But at the same time, when I do participate in these uh, religious rituals and these faith practices, something happens within me that... I think, um, calls me and provokes me to be better. And so for me, it is about like the tradition and the, the rituals and the, um, practices to, to be able to live those out without really fully knowing what they're attached to. And so when I talk about this stuff, I'm not interested in talking about exact 
exact characteristics of God or whatever. It's like, it's about, for me, the practices. And so um, I think I think there's a lot of uh, Christians and other religions that see things that way too. And so I'm, I saw, so yeah, I made that video about like, can you be religious and a materialist at the same time? Because I kept coming across leftists online, mostly Marxists online, who would say, it's impossible. You cannot be a Marxist and materialist at the same time because you cannot believe in anything other than the material you see in front of you. And um, I think that's just ridiculous. Uh, I have two questions there. I mean, one is, is you're saying that, you know, as a, you're, you're a Christian mystic, right? Is how you, you uh, at least yeah. used to identify, right? I would, yeah, I would say a mystic is someone that um, seeks to have an experience of God beyond words or symbols or images with an acknowledgement that those words and symbols and images fail. And so each, each religion has like a mystic tradition. And, um, and what's interesting is usually the mystics of each uh, religious tradition are able to get along great because they both approach those interactions with humility. Yeah. You get a plus three to charisma, but a minus two to physical. So it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so so you believe in in the value of these experiences uh the, the set of practices and rituals that that give some sort of sensual or experiential uh uh something mm -hmm. there, there must be something good or, or you wouldn't do it but you, you say that that you've reached no real epistemological certainty with regards to god and yet you define yourself as as a christian is that faith absurdist in like a Camus sense <laughs> yeah I said that in my video yeah I f what was it it was uh yeah, no I don't I I don't talk like this normally <laughs> I just I'm just regurgitating <laughs> things I hear I know it's funny it's funny to hear someone else saying what I said but it's cool I appreciate it um <laughs> but the uh yeah, so it was uh, the myth of uh, Look, I'm, I'm teeing you up here okay the Thank guy who you. throws the alley-oop has value too I appreciate you <laughs> You just came across uh, the, the same concept that motivates all MSNBC anchors. It's cool to hear other people say the things I say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, what is it? So, yeah, myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus, existentialist, absurdist philosopher. So it's like, uh, I think the line was something like, he, he, he wasn't saying that there is no God or larger meaning. It was not God. It was larger meaning to the universe, ultimate meaning of the universe. He was just saying there's no way that he could ever possibly know it. And there's no way any human could ever possibly know the ultimate meaning of the universe. So the absurd is that conflict between um, man's search for meaning and the universe's complete inability to give us any. And that conflict there is the absurd. And so I relate to that. Like, that's how I feel, I guess, just in a different direction to where I'm like, I, yeah, there's no way I could possibly know, and yet I choose to participate in this anyway. And th that's a bit of absurdism, too, to say, I, I mean, that's the difference between absurdism and nihilism. Nihilism is like, there is no ultimate meaning. Absurdism is, yeah, probably not, but let's try to make meaning anyway in the face of that truth. So why, if you don't know, I mean, uh, you say in that video that really the the probably the, the only anti-materialist reading on God would be to, to say that, uh, oh, I, I, I'm a Christian because God made me a Christian. He, yeah. he put me in this environment. He surrounded me with, with these rituals and symbols. And so that's what I am. Uh, aren't you doing a little bit of that when you say like, no, I can't know, but the Christian one, like, why aren't you an Islamic mystic? Why, why aren't you getting into uh, Judaism? Why do you, do you limit yourself to merely the Christian traditions? Yeah, so, so I, I'll admit that if I was born somewhere else to another family of another religion, then that is what I would be. And I would hope that I would find more open ways of that uh, specific religious tradition um, if that's what I was born as. But I was born in a Christian household, so I'm a Christian. And that for me just means that is just the specific religious lens that I was handed and I'll work with it. I'll work through it. And I think I'm I'm inspired by other religious traditions, especially the mystic side of other religious traditions. But um, this is mine. And so I get to like 
explore this one and kind of uh, shift through this one. And I think it's important for people, uh, if they so choose the religious life, to pick a tradition and then just dig as deep as they possibly can. Um, like there was like an old Buddhist saying that says it's better to pick if you're if you want water, it's better to dig one well six foot deep than six wells one foot deep because you're after the water. And so I see it like that. And, and, th and that was about like picking a tradition and following it. And so I see it like that where it's like this is my tradition and I'll dig as deep as I can as opposed to just having a little bit of vague surfacy knowledge on every religious tradition. Um, really are min-maxing mysticism as, as it's fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, so as a, a materialist, uh, you, you know, you mentioned before that, that some Marxists have a problem uh, with religion or see it as like maybe falling away when we enter the next phase. Yeah. Withering um, is away that... is usually the language, which is kind of funny. Yeah. So, uh, it, what do you see as the future of religion? Is this something where we're all sort of just wasting our time because if we become more enlightened and actually just engage with the immortal science of Marxism, Leninism, <laughs> uh, there won't be this human need. There won't be that this hole that has to be filled with religion. <laughs> that That's funny. You describe it as filling up this hole because for me, like, and others have talked about this too. Like, religion creates like an eve creates this gap of and this hole of unmeaning and abyss of confusion and mystery it doesn't cover it up for me what would cover up my like um gap of mystery and unknowing is to just say there is no god there is no all this religious stuff is fake everyone who ever said anything religious is just mentally ill and it's all just a big scam that would oh my god all my questions would be answered. I would not have any more mystery in my life. For me, it opens it wide up to say that there is something that is provoking humans throughout history that calls them beyond themselves. There's something going on here. And so I think uh, religion has never been like a security blanket. Well, when I was younger, it was like a security blanket. But as I've gotten older, it hasn't been. It's um, really opened a lot of things for me. And so I think religion isn't just that security blanket or that band-aid over uh mystery there's so much more to it and it's um a powerful force that will always exist it will just look differently because religion hasn't always looked the same throughout history it evolves and adapts and so i imagine religion adapting to the new values of a socialist or a communist society it would no longer look like it does under capitalism, but it'll still be around. So a lot of religious institutions that are deeply embedded with capitalism will definitely wither away and collapse, but religion in general won't. And I think we saw that in the transition from feudalism to capitalism and liberalism. People thought, okay, well, we no longer have a monarch requiring a state religion over people, so everyone will pretty much become like deists. And that didn't happen. Instead, um, religion went through a tremendous phase of religious experimentation. And so it's uh, and, and it ended up reflecting the new values of a new society that held democracy as an ideal. And now, then you had like all these denominations who governed themselves instead of one Vatican or one Church of England. And democracy, so, but also capitalism. Yeah, absolutely. And so it'll keep evolving. It'll definitely like keep evolving as society evolves. Um, and so I think uh, people who say that religion would go away when capitalism goes away are giving capitalism way too much credit. Damn, that's a good line. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, there's something that we I wanted to get to earlier, but when you talk about sort of the Richard Dawkins, like, you know, what would really fill the hole is, is just going like, yeah, it, it's all bullshit. God yeah. doesn't exist. All that like. That, that that feels pretty good the the black pill stuff is that is that death of god theology or is no, that just a coincidence in the name death of god theology it was pretty much formulated or at least popularized by thomas altizer in the 1960 thomas altizer was a um literature and theology professor at emory university and he talked about um well, he really just took 
postmodernism seriously, and he took Nietzsche's uh, proclamation of the death of God seriously. And just look, look, looking at like, um, look at our modern world. Look how much we know now. There's no way that these old ways of describing God work anymore. And just taking that seriously and then saying, okay, how could we talk about that phenomenon theologically? And so he would say that on the cross, God died. And then, but, but then he didn't just ascend and go back up to heaven. He just further continued to incarnate into the world. And God's transcendence is completely dead. So language of God's transcendence doesn't work anymore. God is now what fully does that imminent. Mean? Transcendence what is, is like transcendence? A, what is like imminence? above, above and beyond. And then imminence is like here and close and intimate. And so he would say like, yeah, that transcendent God who's above and beyond us is dead. But God is now fully imminent here and a part of creation. Um, and so that that's Altizer's version. But there's other death of God theologians that would say that didn't literally happen. God didn't literally die like the way he said, but it's more of like a symbolic, the way that we used to talk about God doesn't work anymore. So those old conceptions of God are dead. And now we need to find new ways of talking about God in our modern world. Um, and there's, it's also linked to modern um, questions that have come from suffering, like the Holocaust. How do you talk about God after the Holocaust? So many old ways of talking about God no longer work whatsoever after the Holocaust. And so it's it's really about that is just taking our modern world seriously and realizing there's a lot of conceptions of God that don't work anymore and those conceptions of God are dead and um so so it 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 varies there's not like a solid death of God theology tradition it's also called radical theology so you find stuff when you search radical theology too but so it's just like a, quite a few different takes that vary from like god literally died on the cross to um in our modern world a theistic conception of god no longer works it's but it's helpful for, it was helpful for me because i i also like take uh the discoveries of our modern world seriously and i i don't believe in this like literal all-powerful being in the sky calling the shots i don't think that works anymore and I think the more you study history, you see this too, like the way people described God reflected their time period. And so people started talking about God like a king once kings existed, not before. And so there's a lot of ways that people talk about God that reflect their culture. And so just being honest about that, I think, opens things way wide open. And then I would say, that I don't think we can... Um describe god in the ways that we wish to and i'll I'll say this too i think is interesting um the radical theologian peter rollins talks about there's like pretty much four ways of of uh peop that people have talked about god before uh the first one is god as super being which is like that old man in the sky make making shots and intervening and stuff and then there's god as hyper being which is like kind of the way I was describing mysticism before where it's like it's beyond our conception and we god is unable to be grasped unable to be understood unable to be explained and so um god is like is like a hyper being unable to be grasped and then there's god as the ground of being which is something that the theologian Paul Tillich said which is like god isn't apart from us but god is like a part of all of this and there's even like the tradition of panentheism and pantheism. Pantheism says all is God. All things are God. Panentheism says all things are in God or God is in all things. So this is this very like imminent uh, theology. It's like God is not separate and apart in any sort of way. And then the fourth one would be God as event, which is um, another kind of tradition within radical theology of guys like John Caputo that I really like. And that event is also something that uh, the communist philosopher uh, Alain Badu has talked about. Event is pretty much a moment that ruptures everything. Like we're living our life and then something happens that ruptures our whole understanding and what we thought and um, the way things are supposed to go. And we are provoked to respond to that moment of rupture. And so 
there's um and you could talk about these events in all kinds of ways even with like when it comes to the conversation of revolution and strikes and all that but caputo said that god is an event that that's like for him a way to understand god and i, I think that's pretty helpful for me too like um, I mean, strikes are a way of understanding god <laughs> definitely that moment Ro- i mean Ro- rosa luxembourg was on that right every yeah. time the guillotine comes down i see god a little bit yes that moment of spon- that spontaneous moment that calls us to respond <laughs> to um yeah to to really um live up to the moment i think um i think that's like a way of understanding god as well and caputo even compares it with emmanuel levinas and the way he talks about ethics through like the suffering other when you look at the face of the suffering other and you're called with something within you provokes you to do something about the suffering of that person that's not like a a ethical system of morals that's just you see the suffering and you do something about it and also it's your suffering as well like paul and corinthians saying that if one suffers we all suffer with them yeah exactly and so so i i think a lot of people are able to understand god that way and that's kind of what i fall back on usually where it's just like yeah for me that's god i don't need to like develop a full systematic theology to break down the characteristics of this god i'm like fine with that like there's something that provokes me that won't let me alone that uh makes my life better and that's that yeah dope and based and cool <laughs> uh well well we're gonna wrap up uh here i just one last thing i, I want to do just because i i have you here and and i want to take the opportunity perhaps selfishly uh to, to talk about not god but a man definitely just a dude a, a true wild man but but just a dude at the end of the day that's john the baptist oh yeah um i i get a lot from john the baptist it'd probably be a, a like longer episode but long story short, I, I sort of see him as instructive uh, in terms of doing, con- conceiving of and doing revolution or uh, pushing us closer to a, a more equitable, ideally socialist uh, society. Uh, like, like well, again, when you are in the, the imperial core, I, I think uh, I'm not a, a third world Maoist, I, I don't think. <laughs> but I I think those of us here in America are sort of trained into through no fault of our own a consumerist mindset. You know, it, it's a cause and effect. Like if you do this work, then you get this compensation. And I'm always sort of I I, I understand it, but it's sort of frustrating when I see people who will get into leftism and go. Oh my God, this is great. Like we're, we're, we're so close. I, I, you know what I think we're pretty much it's 1917 right now. That's what the Biden election is. Or, you, you know, they, they think that we're, they, they think that they are going to make it to the promised land. Al- although millions upon millions of people struggled for this cause over the last many years now, and they all lived and died their entire life in revolutionary struggle, never getting to see the promised land. There's this American idea that like, well, if I become a leftist, I expect to see results very quickly. I expect to live in, in the, what is it, luxury gay space communism or whatever. That's right. And I, I just don't think that's a, a, a realistic perspective. The, the, the struggle is virtuous, absolutely. But the expectation that you, of all people, are, are entitled to seeing that I just I have a hard time with it, and John the Baptist I I I, I relate to, and I I think he's he's someone worth relating to when it comes to uh, struggling, knowing that you aren't going to see the the fruits of your labor, but beyond setting up the next generation uh, to have a little bit of an easier time, to to creating a more fulsome either vanguard party or set of material conditions through which people can. Uh, push the ball a little bit closer. John is is characterized as literally just just a voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Mm. His yeah. job overtly is to prepare the way of the Lord to make his path straight, not not to actually like be the Messiah. He had no <laughs> illusions about uh, leading people to the Promised Land personally, but what he did was 
you know, he baptized in the Jordan. If you could talk about some of the significance mm -hmm. of that, he baptizes Christ. Christ takes up John's message. A lot of Christ's earliest uh, disciples are literally people that John radicalized and activated and then just hands over to him. You say that what John was doing was he was forming a giant system of sanctified individuals, this huge web of apocalyptic expectations, a network of ticking time bombs all over the Jewish homeland so that when John the Baptist is personally executed, as was always going to happen, you are going to die, uh, the, the movement didn't just end. John had a radical perspective, but he got people to actually like continue to buy in on the movement long term. The being baptized in the Jordan was an actual active commitment. You had to go outside. Even Christ had to go outside and demonstrate his commitment to this ongoing struggle by being baptized by John. It wasn't enough to to know what to do or think these ideas. John like activated people so that something could persist beyond him. And uh I, yeah. I don't know. I just I said I wouldn't start ranting, but, but <laughs> that's like, good. I don't know. I I just love that. There's something so like selfless and forward thinking about knowing the material conditions he was in and saying, you know what, I'm not the guy, uh, but I want to <laughs> make damn sure that when the guy comes, the way is fucking straight for him. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Preach, preacher. That's good. <laughs> um, a little vanguard john but no I, could you say a little bit about uh because it's it's funny I, i'm not one of those big uh my god this is providence or whatever but i, I was like I, I i wish damon had something on on john the baptist uh to talk about and then i, I checked out like your latest video about advent and it was all about john the baptist <laughs> uh, yeah he yeah it's advent time and so which is the season leading up to christmas and um, so during this time, the church reflects on the, um, the that expectation of the birth of Christ or the coming of Christ. And so during this time, the Bible passages that are read um, involve passages about John the Baptist. And so because, yeah, he was uh, there in expectation, making a way. And yeah, also the Jordan, to do that at the Jordan has incredible historical significance because... In the story of Israel, they are in Egypt, enslaved. They cry out to God to free them from slavery. And Moses uh, helps free them, leads them out of Egypt, goes through the Red Sea, parting the waters. And then they are in the wilderness for 40 years wandering. And Moses dies. And Joshua is the new leader of the people leading them as they're trying to get to the promised land. And then he, from the wilderness crosses now the Jordan River, also parting the waters, which was a sign that Moses' spirit or the the spirit that Moses had is now with Joshua, and they go into the promised land. And so John the Baptist starts this movement in the wilderness at the Jordan, where he has people going into the water of the Jordan and coming out ready to go into the promised land. And not for nothing, he he knew his theory. You know, yeah. I joke about like fuck books and all that, but the Jordan wasn't by accident. The fact that he clothed himself in the garments of Elijah as a callback, not an accident. Like he he's done his reading so that when people engage, he knows what to say. He he's doing what in the same way that he's passing things on to Jesus, things have been passed on to him to help him radicalize people. But sorry, yes. continue. So yeah, there's that Elijah connection too, the prophets. Elijah, uh, who who also has an experience at Mount Sinai that like Moses did, and uh, he gets a disciple named Elisha as his successor, and it they go to the Jordan, cross over the Jordan, part the waters, and then Elijah is taken up uh, into heaven away from Elisha, and then Elisha takes his garment and receives Elijah's spirit and crosses the Jordan, uh, parting the waters, and so. I, I, it seems like Elijah and Elisha, that story is reminiscent of that connection between Moses and Joshua, because the writer is, you, there's two ways you can view this. Either the writer is um, making these stories up by, on his own in order to communicate this larger story that 
what God was doing, the liberative work that God was doing through Moses and Joshua, God is now doing through the prophets in the midst of the kings who are causing all this war and bloodshed. You could say he made that up, or you could say that he, he was reporting actual stories, but just wording it in a way that um, would make you could bring to mind Moses and Joshua. And uh, e I think either way, I think Christians could believe either way, but I think the important thing is the meaning of the story. But then you get to the New Testament. I think the writer of the writers of the New Testament are doing the same move there by um, writing in a way that would bring to mind Elijah and Elisha and Moses and Joshua. John the Baptist is now handing off the mantle to Jesus. And Jesus also literally has the same name as these two guys, Joshua. Yeshua. Yeah, Yeshua yep. was his name in Aramaic, which was just the Aramaic version of the Hebrew name, Yahashua, which was Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. Also, Elisha means uh, God saves, uh, Elo Elohim, El saves. And so it's like this, literally the same name three times. And then you even have and like... John, John famously means... Uh, Fuck, just John. That's one. Of, <laughs> that's one of my favorite things about the the origin stories of John the Baptist, which are like very funny. Basically, his dad was like a, a high priest. He went into the temple one day, yeah. came back, and it turned out his wife was pregnant, or he was told his wife was pregnant. And then John uh, gets a suspiciously uh, not Hebrew name. I'm just saying there are signs, uh, but <laughs> yeah, John rules. But continue. Yeah, sorry. Uh, but yes, yeah, so so there is that tradition of like. God's liberative work being passed on to something new. It continues um, throughout generations. And so there is these, um, so they're waiting for another Elijah to uh, pass the mantle to the new Messiah, to the new guy that's going to liberate us. And so usually like uh, there's a ton of people that call themselves Messiah and they would sometimes gather a group of people and say, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one that's going to lead you and we're going to go fight Rome. And then they would be crushed. Other times they would say that I'm like the Elijah figure and we're going to go to uh, this uh, r group of Roman soldiers and wait there for God to send the Messiah down from heaven and be like, we're here, let's go. And Ooh, then nothing don't happened. Don't know about and that one. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, but John the Baptist, he doesn't gather people together so what they would usually do is they would gather people and wait until they have a big enough group and then try to go do something. John the Baptist was sending people home. And so he would have them be baptized and, and so that they know that we are, something is coming. We're to go to the promised land and then go back home and keep living your life with this consciousness, this new consciousness that we all share collectively. And so they... um. And so, yeah, so that's what was different with him. So he just kept sending people back and then Jesus became his disciple and he baptized him. And John the Baptist, it, it's cool that like you're able to notice like how big of a deal he is because you could see like even in the Gospels, we, we could get clues on how the early Christian tradition developed by looking at the differences mm -hmm. between the Gospels because Mark was written first around the year 70 and then uh, Matthew and Luke was written about a decade after that. And then John was written a couple more decades Way after later. that. Yeah. And so we, and so we see uh, even in that story of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus and Mark, it's like very clear. And um, I don't remember the differences now, but then in Matthew, it like kind of de-emphasizes it. It kind of brushes through it. And then in Luke, he even avoids saying the words, John the ba John baptized Jesus. He says something like John was baptizing many people and Jesus was also baptized. It's like he doesn't even want to say those words and then John <laughs> Jesus is baptizing people. John doesn't even baptize them. And so it's very strange but I think what we're seeing is John the Baptist was more famous than Jesus during Jesus lifetime. Oh, a hundo. So yeah, and so one of the the things that they had to do was kind of like get people to realize actually remember jesus was the guy not john the baptist i know you still love john the baptist years and years and years after he died but trust us he was pointing to jesus and so they like oh you can see over time the de-emphasization of john the baptist's role in that whole story but it's because he was such a big deal that's cool yeah i, I just i i i love uh, two things i love and and i'll i'll shut up now uh because we've been going long and, and thank you again damon this is sure. it's been a real 
pleasure for me. Uh, the two lessons I, I learned from John the Baptist is like, number one, uh, you don't have to be Christ. You don't have to be uh, God incarnate to radicalize people and, and move the ball forward. You yeah. really can just be a, a, a guy wearing animal skins and eating bugs in the desert whose dad probably hates him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and you can still uh, uh, move things forward. And that's even with the second thing, even if you're pretty sure you aren't going to get the, the, the dub, the wind condition, that's sort of a, a history of, of left movements is mm -hmm. we're all individually going to take an L, right? What, what matters is if we can collectively for like Bernie used to say before he said, I love Joe Biden, uh, are you willing to fight for someone that isn't you? Yeah. John the Baptist said, hell yeah. Whoever wants to join me in this struggle, I'm I'm fighting for you too. You said when you talk about the the history of that time, that if you were leading one of these messianic uh, and radical movements, especially against uh, Roman military hegemon under uh, Octavian, if you were militant, they killed the leader and absolutely uh, all of his followers. Mm -hmm. If you were peaceful, they killed the leader and let all the followers just go back home and, and think about it. Mm -hmm. That's the environment John was operating in. He knew he was probably going to take an L one way or another. He just knew if he could spread the message far enough before taking that L, there was a pretty good chance that down the line, you'd have a W. And uh, certainly Christianity and the church for what it, it's become now, they got that W eventually. They're, they're doing pretty good. So uh, yeah. in terms of looking for someone, or looking at someone for praxis, you know, if, if we could all be a little more John the Baptist-y in mm -hmm. our promotion of, of socialism in our mindset, uh, in the way we understand our struggle, I don't think it'd be the worst thing. And, and I think it might be nice for getting that W for that person that isn't us. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I really, really like that. Communism is inevitable. Uh, but we're all part <laughs> of that. We're all part of that history that will lead toward that. And um, we all struggle toward that. And so, and I, I think all the time about the people who fought for justice, even specific justices in their specific area and time, and then died without seeing anything change. And uh, we look back and we're thankful for the, those people that struggled for that, even if they didn't get to see the change. And I, so I, I sometimes wonder, like, what are some of those things that we will never see, but we'll still continue to struggle for? And um, we're all, yeah, we're all part of this. And I think a very, like western individualistic mindset makes us think like well if you're not going to personally see it or personally make it happen then it's not worth fighting for when it's like no we're part of this collective movement over time fighting for justice and for equality and we all just join the struggle and then we die through our short blip of existence but it was worth it yeah that's the thing it is worth it, it it's uh knowing that you're going to take the l which is sort of the human experience True. regardless of what you do uh, is is not something that should make you blackpilled. Having a real ideology and and building something, there, there's a real beauty and joy uh, in the struggle. I think that's what uh, John felt. I think that's what all the socialists before us felt. And I think that'll, God willing, if we do our work and set the table, be what the socialists going forward, who eventually do uh, uh, get to see that promised land. I, I, hopefully yeah. that'll be what they feel too. Absolutely. That's beautiful. All right, so uh, speaking of beautiful, let, let's wrap things up by just uh, doing some some coarse commercial promo. Uh, uh, Damon Garcia, I love your stuff. Uh, tell us where we can find you one more time, and if you have anything you're looking forward to, uh, go ahead and, and pitch that. I can tell you that one thing I enjoyed recently and I recommend people check out is your improv style preaching through the ACAB Bible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you what, what was that about the uh yeah all of the bible verses that ended in 1312 i decided to just read and just try to find some meaning and kind of preach on it uh for a, a twitch stream and then i put it up on youtube and uh yeah it, it it was fun because it's like i have all these years of like uh studying theology in the bible and uh it's just kind of sitting in my brain and then I just open up the Bible and go to these random spots and I'm like, oh my God, this is actually really interesting. And so there's actually quite a few things that I hadn't even seen in the Bible before that blew my mind. And so it was pretty fun. 
But uh, yeah, I'm on YouTube, youtube.com slash Damon Garcia. And also patreon.com slash Damon Garcia if you want to support the channel. And then I wish I could be Damon Garcia on everything. But since my last name's Garcia, it's really hard to find usernames uh, because of how common Garcia is. And so on Twitter and Twitch, I'm who is Damon. So check me out on those places too. And thank you for having me on. This is really awesome and fun. Thanks for coming on. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. I feel like there's, yeah, definitely so much more that we can talk about, especially with like how all these weird evangelicals, like I I really want to talk to y'all about Jerry Falwell Jr., but that is another time because we could go on for a long time about that. <laughs> yes. That sounds like a a plan. So so let's do that. Yeah. Definitely would be psyched to have you on again. Also, go on uh, Extremely Online Left again. You guys have a real chemistry. Stock, Spides, and you. I, I enjoyed the hell or the heaven out of that <laughs> yeah they're awesome everyone go follow yeah twitch.tv slash extremely online left australian comrades real comrades all right thank you damon thank you